Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is a, a topic of almost limitless dimension, and literally every slide could be a symposium in its own right. So I think if one reflects on three epochs of clinical medicine, one has a, a, a Renaissance period uh, where basically superstition was dominant. Then you had the emergence of at least symptoms-based medicine, and to some extent we're still trapped in that paradigm. But over the last decade, we've seen increasingly the ability of molecular biology to begin to elucidate uh, the underlying molecular features that give, that give rise to particular diseases and the symptoms that they cause. Of course, the enunciation of a signature is extremely difficult insofar as if you look at the top line there, it is the genome, namely our DNA, but it's the epi in parenthesis there as a prefix, which is probably even more important, but un rarely examined because it reflects all the perversities we inflict upon ourselves in the course of our lifetime in modifying uh, germline DNA. But DNA is an overly simplistic interpretation insofar as one has to think about how does that instructional code give rise to these very complex molecular networks that characterize the 267 cell types that exist in our body. And uh, as a consequence of that, that summed network represents you and me, namely our phenotype at any given time. And then in disease, and I emphasize in the title there, the health disease continuum. Yes, you get hit by a truck or you get appendicitis or you get an infection, that is acute. But most diseases, even before they become clinically evident, are part of a continuum. So the question of how you enunciate the gradual change in the system as it progresses in that continuum is fundamental. And so, yes, there are indeed lesions in the instructional code itself, but the real issue we have to grapple with is what does that mean in terms of the perturbation of the molecular signaling network shown in the middle of the bottom line there, and how do we then utilize that information for more optimum treatment of individuals. The ultimate game of precision medicine, which is still a long way off despite the buzzword component of this, is the fact that we're still, for the most part, uh, dealing with a $2.9 trillion economy in healthcare that relates to reactive response to ongoing disease. What precision medicine will hopefully bring us, if we can elucidate the right signatures, is that right diagnosis, right treatment, right time, and right follow-up. But obviously, the longer-term vision is the fact that how do we utilize that information for sustaining health, so in short, risk identification, not just disease predisposition, which we may have inherited, but what we've been exposed to, a terrible word, the exposome, it's entered the vocabulary of the ohms, but the overall risk mitigation. But the point I really want to make is the complexity of how that instructional code is actually translated into each of us in this room, hopefully in good health, but at the same time, always at constant risk of illness, and the need for deep phenotyping. There is an alarming, naive simplicity that's being propagated at the moment that somehow sequencing genomes will tell us everything that we need to know. I think one needs to actually look at the intellectual fidelity of those who have actually propagated this at the funding level. But nonetheless, it is a very complex interplay between panomics in that pantheon of omics. So whether it be the epigenome, the genome, and you go on, there's actually a website at UC Davis, which I think there are now 440 ohms uh, catalog. But the only point I want to make is the interaction between the genome and all of the omics, also how far our environment over our lifetime and our lifestyle influences that risk. Because we've got to really bring precision medicine to reality for you and me, we have to elucidate the important signatures that are causal, which mean we've got to look at large-scale populations first to find that subset of signatures which are relevant to any given patient. Many of those signatures may require global resources, but even a large and prestigious system like the U, U of M system has a large patient cohort, and we've got to start thinking about how we utilize all of that because we've got to integrate these multiple data sets, molecular, clinical, environmental, and lifestyle, and then start applying data science to those. What is the pattern analysis of signatures in the health disease continuum? creating then not a symptom-based taxonomy of disease, but a true molecular taxonomy of disease. What does that then mean for me and you where we become our own controls? It'll be the delta, if you're continuously monitored, it'll be the delta between where you were at one interval versus another. But it is easily stated, 
but the complexity logistically as well as economically of how you create a continuity of care record from womb to tomb is a theoretical ideal, but uh, at the same time, integrating differences in behavior, risk behavior, the impact of environment, all these things easily stated, but prodigious in terms of both the data they will generate, but also the organization. Because essentially what I call aorta, always on real-time access, because the majority of events that affect our healthcare actually happen outside of organized healthcare facilities. But as we heard this morning, there is a new repertoire of potential monitoring technologies which can be brought to bear. And at the same time, the whole social culture of the interaction of patients, and I use the word consumer well, patient ill, but in reality, consumerism will dictate it probably should just be new patterns of consumer interaction with the healthcare system. We're expanding the touch points in which people's health uh, begins to be identified and at some point we will see a progressive evolution of this blend of online and physical services. It started of course in M Health as we heard from Dr. Murphy today. Uh, there's the beast on the hip, there's the beast on the wrist. All of these things begin at least to provide some of us with information about our health status but also equally importantly it becomes an information for proactive health awareness. And although uh, hypochondria has been replaced by cyberchondria, uh, nonetheless, the overall issue is the fact that it's informing people. This issue of remote monitoring, whether it be telemedicine, uh, robotics used in rural settings, or overt utilization of robotics are all part of this same evolving equation. More and more sensors being embedded into devices, miniaturized devices with new power sources, and a very important dimension of the so-called gray technologies or aging in place. We do not have enough inf nursing home infrastructure to accommodate the cohort of which I'm a member, namely the baby boomers. Over the next 10 to 15 years, this will in fact be an incredible logistical challenge as to how care is delivered, both for compliance. The average 65-year-old is taking three drugs. The average 75-year-old is taking 11 drugs, even without cognitive decline. Actually, compliance is a challenging issue. How do we use modern technology to ensure, as far as possible, cognitive stimulation? And then all of the advantages of being connected. But in all of this, as it evolves, who sets the standards? Who integrates and interprets the data? In healthcare, the most fundamental question of always who pays in everything. So that is going to be a critical issue. Who consents? And equally powerful at the ethical and legal level is who owns the data? And of course, all of this is linked to this sort of broader evolution of social media and its implications for all aspects of society. The issue bullet three is with sufficient data, the numbers do reveal increasingly predictable behavior and individual risk patterns, how far that can then be used for risk mitigation. Obviously, to the last bullet raises a number of very complex issues. But most importantly, it, all of this issue blurs the distinction between life inside a clinical encounter in a clinical facility versus life outside because essentially each one of us becomes a data node. Every encounter, whether it be a clinical encounter or a non-clinical encounter, is a data point and in that sense every individual becomes a research asset. I could have said research subject but let's just simply call it a research asset. And there is of course a great cultural reticence within the high altar of medicine as to how far patients should actually be involved in uh, their own care, but it's happening, whether we like it or not. Provider performance, to be able to look up what is the case fatality after particular categories of surgery, pricing transparency, choice, uh, because user experience, which is permeating every other element of consumer experience, will be visited into medicine. Consumers will want exactly the same portability and transparency that they receive elsewhere. But my remarks are summed here insofar as we've got molecular precision medicine, engineering and device-based medicine, driving then to information-based healthcare, and then it brings us to the blue box of big data. How do we use that big data for outcomes assessment to improve healthcare and create a sustainable health? Not only sustainable health for the individual, that's wellness, economic sustainable health for society because we have a system which is not sustainable. How do we therefore create the new value propositions that go with that? There's no shortage of commercial opinion as to how big data should be managed in healthcare. 
but the bottom line is the fact it's the worst supply chain in our society with regard to information. Depending upon which statistics you read, it's, we are consuming 15 to 20 percent of our GDP on healthcare, and much of that information is embedded in data tombs, fragmented, disconnected, not only for the purposes of larger analysis of meta-analytics, meta but my care and your care. Medical error accounts for the equivalent of the three 747s crash in a day. If the airline industry were that way, none of us would be flying or there would be a requirement for fundamental reform. So there are clearly very important issues uh, to be looked at. Most of our electronic medical records are merely uh, clonal replicants of paper records uh, and essentially not uh, amenable uh, to many types of big data analysis. We haven't captured behavioral and environmental influences we're at constant risk of now with uh, hacking into medical data systems, and we're going to have to come to terms with new policies and procedures as to how we share data in healthcare to give us these very large data sets. So the, the key word there is the painful evolution of electronic medical records. For the most part, the first epoch was merely to do with scheduling and billing. Now, under uh, the High Tech Act and the Office of the National Coordinator, we've moved to compliance, and October 1st, we moved to ICD-10. But it's how, what's going to be the trajectory where we can make this data real-time and actionable for the best clinical uh, decisions. Because, again, once again, we get into V5 territory here. Uh, you've already been introduced to it, but uh, 10 to the 21, the Zeta Byte era probably awaits uh, at least within some nominal trajectory of, say, 10 to 15 years. But most importantly, current institutional structures and competencies are very ill-prepared for this. Just one recent paper amongst many. Uh, obviously, the key issue is bullet three, because obviously it's determined by how many people you do actually sequence, but that's just genomics, not epigenomics, not proteomics. That's just the genomics data, and those numbers dwarf uh, so 100 million to 2 billion people by 2025 will give you 2 to 40 exabytes. Compare that with the projected scale for YouTube at that time and uh, Twitter, and I should have actually said the Sloan uh, Square Kilometer uh, uh, assay system. So the one thing that is clearly critical for us is the fact that there are unavoidable challenges in data evolution. We're already at petabyte and terabyte streams. Our ontologies and formats barely exist to ensure adequate interoperability. We will have to move increasingly to new data analytics, machine learning, and natural language processing, and life in the cloud. And then, of course, the whole purpose of MIDAS, how do we create the new generation of data science and data scientists? But there's going to be a stark fallout from that, what I call digital Darwinism imbalance between different communities. Those who are proactive and move to accommodate this will prosper. Those who fail to develop adequate competency and infrastructure will perish a stark and deserved Darwinian death. And the overall issue is that the structure of information will be fundamental. So data science, what we have to move towards is what the military call intelligence and ingestion. That may not necessarily apply in Afghanistan at the moment, but nonetheless, the overall issue is the fact that how do you take real-time data and so one moves it forward. It is the big end challenge already mentioned. How do we sum the data, not just from the University of Michigan, but maybe globally around certain disease sets? How are we going to integrate that the scale will transcend the population cohort available in all but the largest healthcare providers. I don't know whether the U of M system is large enough for certain uh, analyses. It may very well be. But on the other hand, we also have to think about new models for open data sharing. It's come up. That will require new policies and incentives. There will be proprietary databases. How can they be logically created by industry? How, who've invested a lot of money to create them. How can that investment and return on investment be guaranteed, but at the same time, the data open, uh, the, uh, the data enter the open universe? But the real issue, which of course is the brief of Midas, how do we ask, if we get bigger data, can we ask better questions? How do we think more deeply about the data that's being generated? And it undoubtedly will be destabilizing and disruptive, because what we have to come to terms with is this issue of our own intrinsic uh, bandwidth. There are the limits defined there, and as someone, I apologize, I can't remember the attribution, but 
helping the slow brain catch up with the fast machine. This will undoubtedly be a challenge at many levels, and nowhere will that be more manifest than in clinical medicine already bombarded with the data deluge. The cognitive bandwidth, even amongst the most skilled professionals, means that we will have to move increasingly to automated analytics and decision support, and not in any way to degrade the intellectual decision making, but in so many situations we, we want red don't do it, green do it, and yellow remains ambivalent as to whether you do, because the complexity of many of the interpretational algorithms now has reached this point. Living in a world where the data analytics and now I use a word from the FDA in relation to in vitro uh, multiplex diagnostics, where the interpretation algorithm is obscure to the end user. A lot lurks within that wording from the FDA because it's basically ceding cl clinical decision authority to computerized support system, and there will be one hell of a pushback in an MD-centric culture which is not yet ready uh, to take that on board. At the same time, of course, you have the paradox that those same professionals who reject that logical trajectory uh, nonetheless cede equivalent uh, uh, authority in literally every other aspect of uh, machine-based decision support in other aspects of our lives. But the import importantly, who will have the responsibility to validate and over oversee those underlying data science assumptions used in decision tree analytics for big data? Will it be the conventional regulatory agencies and professional societies, or will it be machines overseeing the legitimacy of the machine-based uh, analyses? So the other element, of course, which is of fundamental importance in the academic environment is in this yin-yang yang diagram, what is the optimum balance between hypothesis-driven research and unbiased data sets and new analytics. Sometimes this gets to have the same resemblance of monotheistic wars. The overall issue is the fact that it has to be a balance, and that balance shifts from time to time. It shifts discipline by discipline. I think right now, uh, at least in terms of molecular biology, which was fundamentally hypothesis-driven research, we've got to move much more now towards uh, the multidisciplinary team-based systems focus of big data sets, but that's a personal opinion. But I think I would submit data science, machine in intelligence, and decision science will change the nature of discovery. Hypothesis-driven research versus unbiased analytics of large data sets. It will change the cultural process by which knowledge is generated. It will change knowledge content. And it will also change the cognitive and intellectual competencies which we will require in order to manage these data streams. And overwhelmingly, it will change education and training and research. So the healthcare ecosystem projected, I think, not within too far horizon will be with the red circles, technology convergence. The life sciences and medicine are combining with engineering, uh, with computing and automation to create an entirely new spectrum of services. On the other hand, the purple circles, the purple circles are the three C's of connectivity, continuity, and consumerism. That expands the care space well beyond the formal clinical facility. And the glue in all of this will be big data, population data, drives precision medicine, and precision medicine will depend upon data uh, science. And of course, that is always the, uh, uh, the, the, the dilemma, but the, the, the changes will be profound. The technology is already with us. It's gaining in an exponential level, as we've heard. How are we going to integrate clinical data, molecular data with clinical and lifestyle data? What is going to be the infrastructure that we need? How will we build continuity in care, even if it's, if it's not the absolute of womb to tomb? Nonetheless, far more proficient delivery of healthcare rather than reactive episode-based intervention, a much greater awareness of what my risk is and your risk even when we're not in the uh, clinical setting. So apart from warmly reciprocating your very kind remarks at the beginning, Brian, my congratulations to you and your colleagues. And I know I haven't filled in all of the UM facilities which have contributed to this, but uh, I applaud very much your vision uh, in putting this together. And it's a great pleasure to be with you at this occasion. Thank you very much. Every single big data set we collect has missing data. The hope is that powerful computers will be able to sift through massive amounts of information to help us in new, amazing ways.
cars can drive themselves as computers learn to sort through all.